Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Travel and Tourism Podcast, my first season. Very, very special guest today. According to Facebook, we have 105 mutual friends. Although we've only crossed paths once, we never work together. We crossed paths at the 2010 Cancun X Geo Reunion 3. His first season was in Eleuthera, Bahamas in the summer of 1990, and he was mini club. And I'm going to mention his chief of village because he's one of my favorites too, Denis Amsalem. So I'm very happy I get to talk about Denis Amsalem later. He is from Fresno, California. He is the one, the only. Please help me give a warm welcome to Chris Wheel. Hey, Chris, how are you, sir? Greg, how are you? Thank you so much. I am so honored to be on this with you. I appreciate your efforts and thank you very much. Oh, no. Thank you for agreeing to do this and uh, share your story with us today. Uh, Absolutely. We had, a, we, we had a little chat before in a pre-interview, if you will, and uh, you you kind of dropped some interesting facts. So we know you're from Fresno. Now, I don't know how, how far back you want to go, but before you tell me how you found out about Club Med, true or false, you went to UCLA. Yes, I did. And true or false, you played basketball, which makes you a Bruin? True. Okay. Now, what position did you play? I was what is called an off guard. And I always joke with people and and put quotes around the word play because I was a a walk on. So I I sat the bench, but I was very active in my cheering for my teammates. Okay, now (laughs) now I hear about walk because I'm from Canada. So I hear about walk ons in football and basketball. What division is UCLA UCLA in? Division one. Oh, it is division one. Okay. Now, how many, but if you were walk-on, how many other walk-ons did you have to beat to get this? There, there was about, there was a tryout of about 50 and they took four of us. Oh, really? That, okay. Yeah. And now the I reason see. they take walk-ons is to fill out the roster, mostly so you can play, uh, have a, a good uh, run during practice so that you can uh, uh, really give the, uh, the scholarship players a run for their money, so to speak. Now, did you have a Rudy moment where you sunk a three-pointer and, and was well, zero seconds left or anything? <laughs> no, I, I did not. Not in, not in a real game, but uh, in my mind in practice, that's what I used to do. <laughs> okay. Now, now John Wooden, the famous coach, was before your time, but I, I, I hear that you, you met him on occasion? Uh, yes, I did. I actually had the pleasure of meeting him twice. When I was, once when I was there at school, he, he was on campus and uh, – it was very nice to all of us came and talked to a handful of us didn't talk about basketball which was odd to me but as you got to hear more about him and understand who he was he was a teacher first rather than a coach and so he he came and asked us about about school and that was important to him to hear how we were doing with that in our studies and then uh he found out that I was in the same fraternity that he was when he was in uh, in college. And so that bonded us a little bit more, too. Uh, fraternity at UCLA? Yes, I was a beta. It's called beta, but it's beta theta pi is the whole, uh, is the whole term. And uh, when that came up, he looked right at me and smiled. And, and we, we, we had a little private talk about his experience there with that uh, – with that part of his his life. And uh, years later, he came to Fresno to do a speaking engagement. And a friend of mine from high school who also went to college with me, we we went and, and listened to him speak. And uh, he spoke for an hour, Greg, with no speech cards, no anything, prompter, anything. And he recited, quote, Bible verses, poems, Things that were really pertinent to what he was talking about, which, again, wasn't basketball. He was talking about teaching and life and and how you raise young adults and uh, really just a lot of things that you see in his very famous pyramid of success is what he was uh, getting across. And then after we went to see if he'd sign our book and he looked up and remembered me which was kind of odd because I started to lose my hair back then. <laughs> but uh, just an amazing, amazing uh, moment for me. Okay, one last question about John Wooden, and we'll move on to Club Med. Now, 
the, the fact that you were both in the same fraternity, does that mean that you could show up at his house and sleep over? Is that what I don't, <laughs> no? okay. I don't know if I okay. could do that. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I don't think I would ever ask, but I knew he had a, a, a lot of children and a lot of grandkids and he, and he talked about his kids and grandkids very much. So I know that he was very involved and they were very important to him, which was a good sign, huh? Yes, yes. Now, at what point, now, you know, living in California, did you, did you hear about Club Med? Did you go there as a guest, GM? As, as I did. Guest? Interesting. It's a good oh, question. Okay. Interesting enough, I, I heard about Club Med from a girlfriend in high school who was actually, her parents were from France, and she's the one who told me about it. And then when we had ended our relationship uh, romantically, we were still friends and still are to this day she went and worked for Club Med as a GO. And I thought that was interesting. I thought, what a great job. I'd love to do this. And, and so I never, uh, what happened to me was upon my graduation, I went uh, on a vacation. Uh, we were supposed to go as a, as a family. And then my, my father passed away. And so we, we stopped, but I wanted to still go. And my mom thought, you know, you should go. Uh, this maybe help you with you're dealing with this time. So I showed up at Eleuthera, which was a family village, as a single and uh, uh, was told later that some of the uh, the geos at the time were like, I can't believe there's a single guy here <laughs> at this family village. But um, I just came on vacation. And of course, by Tuesday, Wednesday of that week, Denny had come to me and asked if I would like to stay and help in the mini club. Okay, wait a minute. Further. Okay, so you're saying you this was summer 1990 when you went on Yes. Okay, yes. So why why would he like approach like how would he have known that you would want to work there? Yeah, it's interesting. Well, my very best friend in Club Med and who is no longer with us, the great and one and only Jim Henry, uh, went to Denny and said, "I think this uh, this guy would maybe want to stay with us and work in the mini club." Uh, I've asked him if he'd like to what he saw and I did I remember we were at the disco one night and he was asking me a lot of questions about what I thought of club and I thought of course Greg it was just wonderful right <laughs> you're just like look at all this everybody's can and you're good though well do yes sports. now now hold on a sec there Chris yeah. but but you were you were there a few days now did you not see like the horrors that the mini club geos had <laughs> like that's the one job everyone goes I'll do anything but mini club but you're like yeah I'll do mini club. like what I, right what, what I, I had not seen that wow. as of yet okay and uh, but I uh so that's how that came about. Jimmy went to uh, to Denny. Denny came to me, and I said, "Of course." And uh, that's what started me down that road. Jim and I ended up doing our first three seasons, my first three seasons together, and uh, we went we went together as a mini club team. There was wow. a. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, were you so were you au pair or did you have a contract for you? I was au pair. I started off, and I didn't get a contract until the end of that season. Okay. Any, and, and you said you, so you, you had graduated, already graduated UCLA? Yes. UCLA? Okay. Yep. All right. Now, okay. How, how many months did you spend as an au pair? I was probably a three. Yeah. I, I came summer. So three, four months into it. So I, I remember being on contract my, my last month or two, not much, but okay. the reason I even got a, a contract is because Denny had asked already, but I like to go with him to his next village, which he was going to be again in the American zone because I, at the time I didn't speak French. And, and I, I tongue in cheek say that I speak a little bit of it now, but um, so, yeah. Okay. No, this is pretty interesting to me. All right. Cause the way this, the, this happened now, cause you're, you're a big sports guy. We know you play basketball. I'm assuming you played a lot of other sports growing up, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like, like what? Oh, just I played football and baseball and things that uh, a lot of California Americans okay. play. So yeah, volleyball. So after how many days were you in the mini club when you saw what the land sports guy was doing? And yeah, like, oh, right. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I'd like to be doing that because I did that my first my first season as well. I didn't like the yes. job I was doing and saw the, how much fun the land sports. So how up approximately how many days or minutes? Did very it take very for you? quickly. Okay, and, and I sized them up too, and it was my friend Didier. <laughs> From Belgium, who okay. was 
in shape like you wouldn't believe, but I, I sized him up very quickly and went, I think I'm better than this guy in just about everything except soccer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But okay. Yeah. I, well, I want to start your first season. Cause yeah, you have an, you have an, an, an unusual path. So since you were, you were already in the village. Okay. Right. Uh, did he, did he at least let you finish out your week as a GM before they. Uh, yes, they drafted? did. They okay. did. It, it's interesting. You know, when I got off the plane at the, at the airport there in Eleuthera, the first geo I saw was the, the wonderful and beautiful Patty Murray. She was planning and she checked me in. And I remember Greg coming out of college. Uh, my father had passed away. I think I was you know, six months into broken up with a girlfriend from college. So, you know, I was in a weird place uh, trying to find myself and, and just thought, hey, I'm going to come here and, and kind of decompress for a week and spend some time on the beach. And I, I met this uh, lovely woman who checked me in and just and I fell in love with her. She became my uh, in-couple girlfriend for the next two seasons. OK, wait a minute and- now. Back up. <laughs> back up. All right. Being a, even sometimes I hear like in a family village they maybe not encouraged, but they don't dissuade you like they'd rather if you're going to be in couple. One of my favorite club med terms. Uh, right. In couple. It, so it was it a, it was OK with Denis that or. or yeah. That, oh, it was. OK, good. Yeah. Good. Denny didn't say anything to me because he I think Denny was there with Isabel, his wife, by the way, I, I still Still yes. talk to both of them very, very frequently. Okay, and uh, they were with their kids. They were with uh, two of, of their of the four boys they have. They had two of them by then. Johan was the oldest. And uh, so they were very much in tune with the family feel. And I think thought, hey, you know, let's keep the, the, the hand holding and things like that to a bare minimum. But they didn't discourage it of us. And uh, it was great because I think Denny, he really enjoyed Patty as well. And who wouldn't? She was beautiful and extremely intelligent. And I'm 6'2". And, and uh, she, I'm going to say she's just a... Six she's two? Six, she, no, I'm 6'2". Oh, she, okay. <laughs> I'm 6'2". And, and I, I was 6'3", 6'2", 6'3". And she, I'm going to be nice to Patty because I love her so much. She, she was 5'11 plus. And I'm going to put it on the heavy plus side. So we looked really good together <laughs> walking okay. around the village. In fact, one of our friends, another, his name was Tony from Belgium. He would, he would yell out, here come the Lakers every time we would walk through the village. And uh, Denny liked that. It's pretty funny. So when you were a GM, you had a seven, you, but you had about seven days off. So did, right. you, did the workload uh, scare you back then? Did you ask like, "Hey, when's my day off?" Or you knew? No, like, I didn't ask any of those questions because you, you didn't have an interview. You're one of those rare GMs right. that didn't really have an interview. You were hired uh, on the spot uh, on vacation. <laughs> absolutely. I not only that, but it was my first club met, so I didn't really understand what the whole premise of it was. So that first week, I was getting. Uh, kind of indoctrinated to to the whole scheduling and doing the events. Okay, I can go water ski. What's this? So for me, that was so much different. And when, and I do want to point out, I think for most Americans, that was such a unique thing because when we went to hotels on vacations, it was kind of up to you to figure out what you wanted to do. And the uniqueness of Club Med was, of course. Uh, the villages are beautiful, Greg, as we know the locations, but it's really the beauty of Club Med was the GO team. They grabbed you by the hand and said, come on, you, you want to come and play softball with us? Hey, do you want to come and do this? And you were like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And that got you involved. And so I was just in that premise. Okay. It wasn't until my week ended that I went, okay, Jim, what do we do? And there was a, a third person there. His name was Jeff Rogers, who I also I still keep in touch with. And his nickname was Fedge, which is just Jeff backwards. And uh, the, the two of them guided me through everything I needed, of course, with with Patty and, and got me kind of into how this is going down. And that still took time, Greg, because as I told everybody, hey, in years later, you know, being an American, you're, you're pretty we're pretty cocky. And then you, you send somebody from California and we're even more cocky because we believe California is the greatest country in the world. And that type of attitude probably uh, 
held me back for a while because uh, I, I didn't understand the greatness that was going to be thrust upon me with surrounding me with so many people, cultures, and languages. I think that is one of the, the knocks on Americans that I try to tell is get out and travel, go see the world. There's more than this the boundaries that, that we are in. And there's, and I think you'll agree with me, there is nothing better, no better teacher have I ever had than, than travel. And Club Med really pushed me on that, that route. Indeed, indeed it did. Now, what was Jim Henry doing when he recommended you? What was his job in the village? He was in mini club at the time. He was just a, a regular mini club GO. Okay. And I just found him to be, I was like drawn to him, his energy, um, the way he carried himself. He went to Berkeley and so uh, UC Berkeley and I was at UCLA. So we had that bond. We had a bond being from California. Uh, same with Jeff Rogers. Jeff uh, was also from California and so was Patty. So, uh, but uh, Jimmy, uh, and I call him Jimmy more than Jim, we just became very, very good friends. In fact, when we did our third season, my third season with him in a row, it made, if you remember, there was the uh, North American newsletter that Club Med would put out out of the New York office. And uh, they did a little blurb on Jim and I doing three seasons together. And I remember they they talked with us and it was uh, the another great man who became a wonderful friend. He's no longer with us. And that was John Shelley, who actually called and talked to Jim and I. And uh, I miss that man as uh, dearly as well. I guess I'd, I'd like to talk about him at the end of the interview, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Now, what age were you assigned in the mini club? Oh, it's a good, good question. Cause you know, it, it I wasn't baby club, um, which I don't believe we had in the Luther. So I think it started with the, the four and five year olds, and then you split them up into five and six, and then seven and eight, and then you had the teen club, which which was good. So, but I don't remember to be honest what was my first group. I just remember being with Jim, and just really no, 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 it's okay. But also, even working in the mini club, you realize it's not like a daycare. I think Americans we get that oh you're just gonna drop them off in daycare. No, man, we get out. We take these kids that, as you know. We're on the beach, we're water skiing, we're taking them to the circus, we're doing arts and crafts. I yes, mean, you're usually singing along as you go to the absolutely right? okay. <laughs> Those songs today still, uh, uh stick you? With us. Uh, okay, no, sorry. <laughs> well, do you have any funny uh, stories from your first season? Like, did you get vomited on a lot by kids? No, I uh, didn't. No? I, oh, okay. I, I have a, a, a good story that I, I do tell people. And, and what I loved about this was it was helping, we, we made sure that the kids got something out of it. And of course, we got something out of it. And that was being from America, Saturdays in America, that's college football day during the fall. And of course, back then in, the, in 1990, just people out there, there was no cell phones, there was no televisions. Club Med really truly was the antidote for civilization. You checked out. And even if you worked there, if you remember, you know, you'd go to the, the, the telephone room, which had four phones and you would call... <laughs> and receive messages so we were kind of out of it with regards to catching our sports college basketball as well but during uh, the fall football season started and there was a bar a very famous bar called ronnie tideaway in governor's harbor everybody called the owner ronnie but his real name was mark he had a couple of big screen tvs and pool tables and and some video games and just, you know, a lot of play. It was a place that GOs went and hung out on their time off. Well, Jim had an idea and, and, and the idea revolved around going and being able to watch football on a Saturday afternoon, but at the same time do something that the kids would enjoy. And it had to be the older kids that, that, that group that was, you know, the, the nine year old to, to early teens and the reason was is because we, we planned a field trip. Governor's Harbor, where uh, on Aleutha, where the Club Med was, was located, was split into two. two. The, the village was on the Atlantic side, and then you, you took a shuttle uh, to the actual harbor, which had the water sports, the scuba diving, the sailing, the water ski. And that's where uh, also what was technically that 
location was the first democracy in the new world. It is uh, where uh, what was established uh, government wise uh, way before Club Med, of course. So that had a lot of historical value. And so we, we, and uh, I, I'm saying we because I'm laughing now, but this is all Mr. Mr. Henry's idea because he was just so, so bright. He said, we should take a field trip Saturday afternoon. We'll take the kids down to the first democracy in the new world and we'll show them the government buildings and we'll show them the cemetery and show them that there's, you know, people buried there that uh, say 16, you know, 1680 on it and 1700s and all of that. But more importantly was at this time, Greg, the, the cruise ships were planning on coming into Governor's Harbor. So to do so, they had to drudge the harbor in a certain area. And when they did so in, in digging up the bottom and made big piles of uh, sand on the side, it, it produced a lot of shells. I don't know if you're familiar, but Eleuthera just for some reason had a lot of seashells. So we gave that hill a name Shell Hill. So we did the tour of the first democracy and the government buildings and the cemetery and all that. And, and then we let the kids spend a little time on Shell Hill collecting shells and these little bags we provided for them. Now, Greg, the genius behind this was great. I was, uh, was Jim going, we're not going to bring any water. And I said, why? The kids got a drink. They're going to be crazy. He goes, no, 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 we'll, we'll be okay. So sure enough, like, the kids, you know, after this amount of time, I think we, you know, you spend about an hour on this field trip, maybe a little bit more. The kids are thirsty. And, and so we would say, well, gosh, we don't have any water, but there's a little establishment right here at the bottom of, of, uh, Shell Hill called Ronnie's Hideaway. And I know they have drinks in there. So let's go on in, in there. And we did, we took all the kids in there and Ronnie or Mark was waiting. Other GOs would be waiting for us. The game was on and these kids would walk in, they'd get stuff to drink and the GOs would give them money to play pool, play video games, uh, you know, just kind of hang out in that atmosphere. But we got to watch all of our, all of our football games. And these kids got treated, you know, they loved it. And, and one time, one time, Greg, we, and we had to be back. There was a shuttle. So you had to be back by five because that's when the parents were picking up the kids. And so one time, Greg, we, we were late. And we were really late. We were like, you know, 5.30. And we pull up to the front of the village. And we, I can see the chief of uh, mini club, Joel. She's there with a bunch of parents. They're waiting. They're, you know, they're worried. We get out and of course, Joel reads me the riot act in French and I didn't know what she was saying, but I could, I, I got a good idea of what she was saying. And I heard a, a dad go to one of the kids. He goes, where were you guys? And he goes, we were in a bar playing pool and watching football. And the dad looked up and he goes, now that's a Saturday. And, <laughs> and we, we ended up not getting in trouble. Uh, then he asked us where we were and he, he still liked the idea. So, the trip to Shell Hill continued on through football season, and it became like a code word. We would let other services know Shell Hill today, which uh, meant great. Meet you guys at the bar to watch some football and uh, bring some Bahamian dollars so we can treat these these kids to some some sodas and some food <laughs> and and endless games of pool and video games for them. <laughs> Excellent. Never never heard that story before. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I see by the uh, the list you sent me, you you okay. So like you said, you mentioned you followed Denis to Punta Cana. Yeah. Where you had a contract. Right. Okay. So uh, I want to talk about Denis for a sec because I I met him. Uh, he was my chief of village in ninety eight ninety nine. He's the man solely responsible for sending me on the chief of sports stage, which uh, which uh, which I did. I left from Martinique to Godopio and. Uh, one thing I observed about Denis, and you tell me if he was doing this back then, so this was 9899, of all the chief of villages I've, I've known, he was the only one who he spent all his waking day thinking about how to generate money for the village, and I mean locally too. If, if right. the numbers were down, he would say, well, let's get some church groups in here, let's, and Martinique, I think he put the number of the Club Med on top of the sailing shack because planes were flying overhead. He wanted the pile of snow. Did, did you see any of that uh, in Alisa? I, I did, not, not with in what you saw, but what okay. I saw right away with Denny was he was very business oriented. And uh, we had a great, great chief of bar, Terry Drummy, who is um, 
still oh, a was, wonderful was he a friend. Chief of bar? He was chief of I, bar. I see him a lot on Facebook, but I wasn't sure what job he did in Club Med. Right. Okay. He, okay. he went on soon after that to be called, uh, become chief of the zone. And uh, if Terry's listening, he's uh, we met, we want him to come back home soon. We, we miss him. He's uh, he's married now and uh, has a, a wonderful place, Hemingway's in Turquoise. And he's actually building a home in the Dominican Republic. Uh, he, not, he owns a bar on? On Turks, Turks and Turks? Yes, he does. Oh, Called yes. Hemingways. It's oh, wonderful. Okay. Okay. And he is one of the most generous people, Greg, you will ever, ever, ever meet. Uh, just a wonderful individual. He was chief of bar, but I remember Denny talking with him about ways that we could get the numbers up with drinks. And, you know, uh, I, I didn't see, you know, chiefs of villages really get into that type of understanding about those types of finances, you kind of left it up to the chief of service. You know, you made your money with a good butcher and a good chief of bar. And uh, that's what Denny let me know. He goes, that's where you make the money. And so, yes, I saw that, but in a different way. He was wanted to make sure that the numbers got back from the village he was at, got back to Paris, that he's making money, even when it might be a little bit down with attendance. But just a, just a, a great a guy, I think of him, uh, he's like a father figure to me. He really is. Okay, two, que two more questions about Denis, because I'm wondering at what point he started this, because he would do something in Martinique, I believe it was called Chef de Gar. That meant yeah. any, any geo that made a mistake right. had to dress up as, I think, as a train conductor or something. Right. Uh, okay, was he doing this back then? He was doing that, and he was also doing his famous, he's more famous, Greg, for his In the Pool which was also oh in the pool no right uh, okay if now it, what was okay now remind me oh it's coming back but what um what, what happened within the pool if what a geo that? made a mistake especially during crazy signs he would oh, stop oh yeah and, and have the you know and look and go uh chris i think you made a mistake with crazy signs i'm like i don't know what crazy <laughs> signs are i'm just trying to figure this out he's like well but that's a mistake and uh so <laughs> we pool? all chant and he would get the geos and of course the crowd in the pool and they loved it and i would have to run with all my clothes on and jump in the pool and come out and and sopping wet and finish up what we were doing okay and uh it was thank just god. great it was yeah. you got thank the god. crowd Mar participating Mar martinique didn't have a pool the year i was there so that's good that's probably now, why <laughs> now were you ever were you ever chef de guard did you have to die no i didn't I, okay okay <laughs> When I, I had a choice, it was when I was up for Chef de Gar after another another pair, um, I had the choice of luggage duty or Chef de Gar. And I, okay. just, I said, I'll do the luggage duty. <laughs> All right. Now, another question. He used to do this thing and it used to drive me crazy and I hated it. But uh, OK, I'll explain it. So when the rivals, a big arrival would come in on uh, Saturday or Sunday. Maybe the song wasn't out at the time or, or maybe he used a different song. He would give every all the geos would have to go in the theater with a balloon. And he would play this song and we'd all have to twirl our balloons above our head while the GMs walked in. Did he do this? No, you? we did not do that. Uh, that, that would bug me too. <laughs> well, you know what? I hate it. I thought this is the silliest, stupidest thing. I right. it every Sunday, but I got to admit, we used to do the song called We We Like to Party by the Venga Boys. And I yeah. swear to God, that, that song became an earworm and I, I still right. listen to that song now and it makes me smile now because it's a, it's a great it memory does. now. And there was a, a song we had called, well, a bunch of them, but it was called She's Fat. And uh, what was it called? Sorry. She's Fat. And like, it was a like Bahamian PH, song. P-H-A-T? Yeah, P-H-A-T. And, okay. and I, I still have that. And it, that was just, you know, what you just described was, you see with a lot of chiefs, they had a routine and they took that routine to each village they went to and maybe, you know, change it up a little bit. Denny's routine was kind of his skeleton that he took around, but he did a lot of things that he changed up to fit the village, to fit the theme and the, the feel of the village. So it wouldn't, it doesn't surprise me that he changed songs. He changed the way you, you greeted the guests. He probably changed the departures. They were never always alike. And, you know, I think that just speaks of Denny. He was always thinking of ways he would always tell us individually and as a group, when they leave, when the guests leave, he wants them to say this was the best vacation they ever had. Privately, he would tell us, you know, Chris, you took care of that kid all week long. And when that kid gets older, he's going to remember you. He's going to remember a little bit about the trees and the beach, but he's going to remember you. And so 
that type of focus and really customer customer care, uh, which is is uh, kind of a lost art, I think nowadays. But uh, customer service is what Danny was all about. Yeah, and I think he was. Uh, before, I think he was a chief of any club. Yeah, he he uh, yeah he he did a lot of things. He's just a, a great guy. In fact, in our team picture that we have for Eleuthera, we all have shirts on that say "In the Pool," and we're standing at with the pool in front of us, and Denny is in mid-flight. He's stretched out vertical, diving into the pool, and uh, they got it. And it's just a great, <laughs> it's a great photo. <laughs> okay, so I get, I get how you went from Eleuthera to Punta. You followed Denny, and yes, I would have followed that man anywhere. I'm a little right. confused by your third season now, because normally, uh, after you do your great season in Punta, they go, "Thank you, Chris. Where would you like to go?" For some reason, right. some unknown reason, you go to Sandpiper. Your that's right. your third family village in a row with well, a new chief, uh, Bernard Vigier, and mini club, not land sports. So what, what, what happened there? Am I a little well, confused? let me, yeah, let me describe that. So Denny was going back to Europe after. Uh, he was going to Israel, I believe, after um, Punta Cana. And since I didn't speak French, I couldn't okay. go. Okay, I get, I get and, that part. Okay. Right, right. So what happened, which I, I joke around with this, is I got into a, a, a kind of a discussion. I'll call it a discussion with my mini club chief, uh, who is just a wonderful, wonderful lady. And uh, it, it ended with her being very angry with me. And so she uh, made a call to another wonderful lady in New York, MJ, and they were gonna not place me the next season. And what, what it happened was when, when Denny left the village, he had a week to close Punta Cana. Back then Punta Cana would close because of the, of the weather, it would get too hot during the summer. And so we had a week to close the village down. And uh, I looked around and a lot of the services were, you know, that first couple of days, Greg, they were, taking time to go. The, the circus team was running the trapeze and people were were doing trapeze and the water ski team was water skiing and people were, you know, it was all geos. And uh, so, but we had to be down at the mini club and get that thing cleaned up. And I, I kind of was reluctant. I just felt, give us a couple of days to hang out with everybody and then we'll get this mini club thing done. And, and that didn't go over very well. So uh, Denny came to the rescue because I wasn't going to get placed, and uh, I was back in California. Jim Henry got a hold of Denny, and uh, I, Denny said he'll take care of it. I got a call from MJ, and her, it was very short. And by the way, MJ is a wonderful friend to this day. She said, I don't know what you did, but I got to place you. <laughs> I said, okay. And she said, so I'm sending you to Sandpiper with your buddy Jim. And so what happened was uh, Denny called and talked to the New York office, and then he was very close to Bernard. And I'm very happy the way the universe worked out for that because Bernard is another person who I hold in very high regard. Just a wonderful man, another person who taught me a lot of things when we were by ourselves, when he would talk about management and 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 those types of things with the hotel. So. That's, Bernard, what, that's how I Bernard, ended up. Uh, Vigier, correct? Right, Bernard okay. Vigier. Bernard Vigier. And, okay. And, but it was per, it was great. It was like I said, the universe had a plan. I went there. I got out of the got out of the. Uh, I, I took my uh, my plane. Uh, I got the the van ride from the airport to the village. I'm in with the one and only Teach Mayor, uh, who would end up becoming my roommate there. And we talked, and Jim greeted me. As I pulled up, Jim was waiting for me to get out of the van. And he took me, Greg, to the office to get my paperwork done, where I was entranced by the secretary, uh, Caroline. And, uh, and I walked out. This is a true story, Greg. He goes, what's the matter with you? And I go, who is that? And he goes, that's Caroline, the secretary. And I said, she's going to be my wife. And Greg, sure enough, that's who I married. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, Isn't that crazy? Well, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad Sandpiper wasn't a swing in singles village. No, know? it and, wasn't. And, and, so I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, now, wait, that was Teach. If you were roommates, then he wasn't chief of mini club yet? No, Teach was first season. Uh, oh, let me really? tell you how special he was. And by the way, he's up here in Napa Valley now running a, running a hotel here in California. But 
Teach was an amazing, amazing individual, uh, hilarious, very well educated, a Harvard graduate, first season mini club geo. And by the end of that first season, he was being uh, pushed into a stage. He spoke French already into a stage for mini club chief. And I think one thing about Bernard and a lot of chefs of Villages back then was they saw talent. They saw people who can better the company going forward. And they were right to grab Teach and put him on that path who eventually became chief of village. And uh, yeah, just another spectacular individual that I uh, got to share many great moments with. He serenaded Caroline and I uh, in our room one, one day with his mandolin as he played his version of a, a poison song and so we were just laughing. So he's just multi-talented. Let me get this straight. Teach played a poison song, a heavy metal song, on, on, and he plays the mandolin? And he plays the mandolin, okay. and he plays it very well, by the way. I did. And uh, yeah, and, and the way he, he, he did this version of the song was a softer version, obviously, but I knew the words, and Caroline was just looking at me like, what is going on with you two idiots? And <laughs> Okay. All right, well... Well, we, we have to, we have more to cover because okay before we launch into your fourth season okay now you worked with Greg Snyder now before you say anything okay I, I haven't spoke about Greg yet because I only knew him for three weeks but I right. want to share two quick Greg Snyder stories with you then I'd like to get your Greg Snyder stories is that okay absolutely okay so it's my first season Turks and Caicos I'm young I'm a rookie I don't know what I'm doing you know it's the great uh, the great chief Pierre, uh, chief of village Jean Pierre Grand he's leaving and I hear we're getting a new chief. And all of a sudden, one by one, these geos come up. They oh my God, Greg, Greg, you're effed. You're effed. And why? I go, the new chief's coming in. Yeah, because his name's Greg, too. Okay. Yeah, but he's blonde. He's good looking. He has abs. He's going to hate you. <laughs> so I'm already, I'm one of those guys that could be the best geo in the world, but I think I'm going to be fired first. Okay. So I'm I'm panicking. I'm like, oh God, you know, and, and um, you know, but <laughs> So this kept, the, the Geos kept doing this, but you know, that couldn't have been further from the truth. Okay, I, even though I was only with him three weeks, I think he was coming in from Corfu, you know, and I was doing a land sports and scuba gestion. He could have been, you know, more, more gracious. The second memory I have of him, and I'll tell you, I've never told this before. It's he did the best uh, departure of any chief of village I've ever seen it was Turks. So it was uh, like October, he, you know, Greg was great at every sport and he was really good at windsurfing. So he yeah. had to leave, the wind was howling, he had to leave the windsurfing and do the departure. And this is happening in slow motion as I see it. I still remember this day, 1994. Uh, all of a sudden I see a sea of geos and GMs parting, okay, in slow motion, like And I see a guy coming in the middle of this, like Moses, okay. He's got a shorty wetsuit on, but it's rolled down. His body's muscular. He's got the salt spray on him. His, his muscles are glistening. The sun's bouncing off his golden hair, okay? Women are fainting, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. left and right. He looked like a, a, a Greek god, okay? I thought, this is the coolest guy, right. the coolest departure I've ever seen in my life. He just right. rolled, rolled down his and did the departure and then went back windsurfing. So, Greg, if you're listening, I still, I still have this memory in my head. Bravo, okay? <laughs> now, I would like to hear your story because you finally get land sports. Right. Now, did you, uh, so doing three seasons of mini club and actually doing three full seasons in, in a, in a, in family villages going to Playa must have been a bit of a shock because you were there in right. 90, 91, 92. Was there any uh, pushback to get land sports? Or no, there, there wasn't. And what, what happened here was I was on a mini club team three seasons in a row where uh, it was, there was a lot of, of males. There was Jim Henry, there was Tim Kruger, Jeff Rogers. We were all pretty good athletes, a couple others. And and it was it started in a, in a Luthro, we saw it. You know, we would have those challenges for the guests to see the sports team versus the mini club team and water polo and and softball. And people would come out and watch and all this. And and nothing against those wonderful sports teams. But like, we never lost to them in three seasons. We, we would joke around and go, we're better athletes than you guys. And uh, I know there's some listening that are going, oh, that's, that's a bunch of bull. <laughs> but, we, <laughs> yeah. but we beat them. And I remember asking Bernard, I'd like to switch. And he goes, I think you should switch to, to land sports. Now he goes, I'm going to send you with a really good friend of mine. It's his first season. And he goes, and you met him when he came through here 
uh, a few months ago and they did, you know how Sandpiper was, it was a place where it gathered for meetings. So there was at the time a big uh, chief of sports thing. And I remember Greg when he came in and I had heard all the, the things that you had probably heard about him as well. However, I did not witness that. He actually, we talked one night at the bar just briefly, it was just him and I and being an American, uh, I was an American, he liked sports, I liked sports, we, we bonded very quickly. So I, I had a, 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 a good feeling about him. But when I went to, uh, I was told that when I go to Playa Blanca, my favorite village, by the way, <laughs> um, I was going to be under a, a, a guy named John Popolo, who is just a wonderful yes. human being. And, and John was on his route up the ladder and he was going to be, uh, there were going to be two land sports. It was going to be, uh, John was going to be the leader and I was going to be under him. The reason so was, was Greg had an idea that he wanted heavy, uh, because Playa was so uh, small, you know, there was a lot of uh, confinement the way it's structured there, but we did a lot of land sports stuff. So we were constantly doing things, uh, two events going on at once, volleyball here and uh, we were doing lawn bowling, you know, at the other place. And so Greg really wanted to emphasize the activities and and what you saw of him. He was very in, in shape and and tan, and he wanted to present that to the guests. Hey, this is your, when you come on vacation here, you can do nothing. That's fine. But if you want to be active, this is the place to be active. At. We had wall climbing, you know, up scuba kayaking, all of it. And, and so, uh, but it was also a chance for me to learn from John Popolo, who put up with my cockiness very well, more than probably better than I would have my own self. But uh, he was just a great person to, uh, to be with during those times. We had two floods, by the way, there we had two flash floods. And that really brings the team together. And, uh, and then we also had Atlantis, which is the gay and lesbian organization, Renta Village. They came, which was a, quite an experience, just a wonderful, wonderful week uh, with just incredible individual guests. So it was just a unique season, but that's how I got to Playa. Well, let, let me ask you a, a sec, Chris, because you mentioned Caroline from Sandpiper. So did you go to Playa Blanca single or did you go with your girlfriend? I went with my girlfriend. We were in couple. Okay. And we went together and, and Bernard worked that out, Bernard. And of course, his his uh, girlfriend at the time, Claudia, uh, were very much behind us. In fact, I hope to see Claudia in Paris in uh, um, September coming up here. And we still, like I said, I keep in touch with all of them. But we came as a couple and Greg had no problem with it. He just asked us not to be no PDA, no public displays sure. of affection. Um, but let because me it's you, a singles village. Let me ask you this. I arrived a single and and then stupidly, you know, because I'm an idiot. <laughs> right. You know, I, let's just say I had a girlfriend in every singles village I worked out and I was I was alone in family villages. So even though you weren't doing PDA and all that, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you found at the time that, or did you find that certain women were direct and like hitting on you in view of your girlfriend? Did, well, did you know, happen? what I found out was when you don't put that vibe out, when you you have that vibe that you, you're you single and you're looking for it, you usually it's a little, that vibe is kind of, I think, standoff. Oh, true, true. But, hmm? but still, when you have but, the vibe but, that but still, I'm not but, looking for it. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. I did the same because, you know, my right. a little right. outside, nothing wrong they, with that. They, but even they do come vibe, yeah, they, I was just curious if you had a, or actually, yes, any, they, any, they, any funny story from Playa will we'll do. I was just curious because we were, no, I, it's, you know, moment. it's, it's interesting is that um, the, you know, few funny stories there was, well, first Greg, my, my girlfriend was his secretary and Greg was new and, and uh, you know, Greg liked to, to stay out late. So uh, Caroline, there was times where, she was like the pseudo chief of the village because she was on the phone with uh, Paris, you know, doing the checking in, giving them the numbers, doing all of this stuff. And Greg's, you know, doing this, he'll be coming down soon. And, and really was like his right hand person on the administrative side. There was also some others. We had Steve Cohn as the That's gestionaire right. who was wonderful. That's right. He just, he ran a tight ship with the numbers, just a great team. And, but so, you know, as, as happens, you know, girlfriends and boyfriends get in arguments and have fights. 
So uh, that, you know, one of those times with Caroline and I, we had a disagreement and it was leading to, a, a, you know, at the time you're like, we're going to probably break up or whatever. And I just remember Greg pulling me into his office and going, all right, I, I can't have this. And I'm like, what's the matter? He goes, your wife, and that's how he would call it. He goes, your wife is really upset right now. So you got to make good on this. You got to figure this out because I can't have this. I can't have her down. She, I need her running on full, you know, full force and helping me. So you're going to apologize to her. <laughs> you're going to do this and this. And he laid it all out to me. And I'm like, well, Greg, you're not even listening to my side of the story. And he's like, I, I don't need to. This is business. You got to make good. And so that, but that's one funny story because I just love Greg for that, for, uh, you know, cutting right to the chase and realizing how things get done. Now, another story that I have from, and I have many, but uh, Bernard and Claudia got married after uh, Sandpiper that I do with them. And we were all very happy. And they chose to come and spend their honeymoon in Playa Blanca. And Greg, as you can guess, one of his best friends with Bernard put on a wonderful week for them. Just incredible things we did for Claudia and Bernard. We all became closer with them because of it. We were already close to them, that team that came from there. But, you know, and, and, and you know, and I want to say something. Claudia was, even though she was the chef de Village's wife now, but girlfriend, Claudia was always a GO at heart. You know what I mean? She'd be the one at the bar hanging with the regular GOs. And she didn't mind hobnobbing with the, the upper echelon of club med management when it came into town, but she really just enjoyed being with the regular GOs, as we call them. So he was great. But so one night, Greg, he has this idea. Next door is a wonderful place called Costa Carreras, has a wonderful restaurant. Greg is going to, uh, we had horseback in Playa. He is going to take a horseback ride with and lead Bernard and Claudia over to Costa Correas where they'll have dinner and then they'll ride back. And it sounded romantic, it sounded great. So he goes into the bank as they're about ready to leave and he looks at our friend, John Lane, JB, John Bank is what he was called, from uh, exit 109 in New Jersey. And he says to, to JB, give me a thousand. And what he meant was he wanted a thousand dollars. To pay because Costa Crayas didn't take credit card at this time, and 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 uh, so he wanted the cash. And he wanted enough to pay for drinks and everything for them. But John, being who he is, he gave him a thousand, Greg, but he gave him a thousand pesos. But Greg didn't look at it; he just shoved it in his pocket, and and oh, JB yeah. didn't think anything of it right. until he got a phone call about three hours later, just screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to get over to the coast of Korea quickly and bring American dollars as he pulls out a thousand pesos on a bill that was right around like uh, 600 American dollars. And of course, uh, pesos back then, I think, yeah. I think Greg probably had, you know, $60. <laughs> <laughs> we all just chuckled. And I think if I remember correctly, we took Greg's car. It was, he had a little VW bug that was a Chef de Village car. And of course, we had to do things. Greg, you remember your buddies in Club Med. We had to do it as a group. JB was one of our friends, Dan Oscuba. Uh, we all had to go together. You know, we, we weren't going to let our, our boy go by himself. So we all showed up and gave him the money. And he, Greg was just screaming and yelling. And we were just laughing in the car ride back. But uh, yeah, Greg uh, Greg is like a, a big brother to me. I think, uh, I think the stories you hear about him, they're probably true. Um, I can tell you the Greg that, uh, that is now. Uh, that we would witness and see is uh, he's just a good hearted, very generous person. He's a great husband. Uh, he married Lou from uh, Brazil. And I think that uh, Brazilian hot blood uh, keeps him in line. But uh, my last story was Greg did something so unique at Playa Blanca. There was on the way from the, the theater to archery, there was basically a little, it looked like a skating rink, but it wasn't, it was concrete. Greg, Greg had the idea to build this out a little bit. Yeah, and I was, for, gonna, I was gonna ask you about that because you, you were yeah, there for the- And for the sake of the, the, the yeah, for the sake of the 
Canadians, the, especially the, uh, the, the Quebecis who loved hockey, he put in rollerblade hockey and it was went over like gangbusters. I mean, just an incredible flux. Of course, Americans, there's a certain that northeastern part of the United States loves hockey. Californians now love it. Everybody wanted to do this. It was a smaller rink. You couldn't have, I think you could possibly play, you know, three on three. Some games were two on two, but you had a waiting, uh, a line of people waiting to play. And it just was amazing. I remember looking at him going, Dude, this was genius. And he said, I've always wanted to do it. Being from Minnesota, he's a hockey player, right? Amongst the many things that he's so good at. So yeah, that was uh, something really unique that I, that I saw with him. And he did so. Hey, Chris, just a sec. I spoke at the beginning how I met you at an ex geo reunion, but I think you explained to me in your your pre interview that you actually were attending ex geo reunions a very long time ago through John Shelley. Is that true? Absolutely. John Shelley was a masterful mastermind, another educated, uh, highly intelligent individual who was a DO in the villages, but went to the went to the offices in New York. And uh, just a, just a, a, one of the special, special people in the world uh, you'll ever meet. He had the idea of let's do some reunions. And these reunions weren't going to take place at a village. The reason was is John did not want uh, the GOs to have to spend money on something. He was trying at the time, like behind the scenes, to get Club Med to sponsor or pay for GOs to come back during certain times, off season times, he felt it was a good way to keep the family and the tribe together. So what he did was the first couple of XGO reunions were basically West Coast, California things. They were in San Francisco and heavily marketed through phone calls and faxes, if you can remember what a fax is. And uh, emails were a little bit coming out, but you really pumped it up. And we did them at some local bars uh, a couple of which um, were owned by a gentleman named Max Young. Max is still in San Francisco. Max was an au pair for Club Med in Playa Blanca with Greg. Caught the fever, and I, I say that with, with pure conviction, the fever of what it means to be in this, this geo tribe, whether you're an ex-geo or a geo. And so we did those reunions there uh, at these little bars. Yeah, it was... Uh, it was really kind of a, the birth of all of this that started. And unfortunately, as you know, John is no longer with us. And uh, that's the sad part about getting older, Greg. Uh, these reunions are wonderful because you pick up, as you know, right where you left off with, with a lot of these faces you see, because you, you live with them, you love with them, you cry with them. Um, you really become a family during that, that time. And, but as we get older, some aren't with us. And Jim and and John are not with us anymore, as is another great friend of mine, John uh, Bubba Devereaux. He's no longer with us. And so for, for those who aren't with us, uh, you're, you're not forgotten. Um, I'm, I'm part Hispanic, and we say that you're never truly gone as long as someone speaks your name. So, yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. The, name, the name lives on. The memories live on. Right. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do I have time for a quick John Shelley story? Yes, sir. Yes, you do. My first season uh, in, in Eleuthera with Denny was the 40th anniversary of Club Med. So that's where I got to meet the Trigono family when they came through. More importantly, a gentleman came there that, that was, a, a, was coming to perform through John Shelley in New York. And that gentleman's name is Richie Canada. Uh, Richie still is a friend to this day. Richie is famous because he is saxophone player for Billy Joel, uh, original, original band, all of it. And then he went after Billy Joel took some time off. He was with the Beach Boys, but he also does his own bit. He, he also wrote the song Nentumba for Club Med, which was played at arrivals and departures for many, many years in the uh, late nineties. And so when Richie came to, to Club Med to perform. He came with his own band called Rico, which consisted of, of a super band. He had a couple of players from the jazz and fusion band Spyro Gyra. They were from New York. He had the keyboardist who uh, played with Jimi Hendrix. In fact, uh, played with Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. 
So just a great band. And so they performed for the, the Trigano family and all the guests that were there for this one special week. And then they took us and it was John's idea. This is where John was always thinking about the geos. He said, the geos are going to be gone tonight. And we went to the beach and that beautiful beach in Eleuthera, which is not white sand, it's, it's pink sand. And it's like baby powder. And on that beach with only the geos, Richie Kanata and his band with their acoustic guitars and a huge bonfire with drinks flowing, played for almost two hours Beatles songs. We and we sang as loud as possible. I, <laughs> I get a little choked up uh, thinking about it because I remember my friend Jimmy was just so uh, he was just looking around going, Can you believe this? Look at this, all these different languages and cultures. And we're singing All You Need Is Love. And I said, right. I go, it's amazing. And that's the type of stuff John Shelley did. He always thought of the geos first. The guests were important, but he wasn't, he wasn't doing that work for the guests. He was placing geos, making sure the teams worked well together. But more importantly, making sure the geos were happy because he knew like, if you're a happy geo, that's gonna, if your tank's full, you're going to give it out tenfold to the guests, right? So. I miss those people deeply. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's the rare person that can actually, like, not only are they living in the moment, but they're actually telling themselves, like, remember this moment and then, you know, point, like he pointed out to you, can you believe, like, right. look, look what we're doing, right. look what we're experiencing. Yeah, that's, that's, right. that's pretty rare. Wow, it's a great story, Chris. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, you. Uh, do you have time for one more question? Yes, I do. This might be a tough one. You might have answered it already. Of all the seasons you did, did you find that one was stood out in one way? Or did you like the ball separately for different reasons? Playa Blanca stood out for me. And I did a couple after that we just don't have time to get into. But yeah, Playa Blanca, because it was my first singles village, because that team was so tight, Greg's first Greg's first uh, season as Chef de Village. That was that's the one that stands out to me, but overall, I think you would attest to it as would any XGO listening or the whole experience was life changing for me. From I met my wife there, the people that I meet. The only reason I'm on social media, Greg, was <laughs> <laughs> I got I got to you know Jimmy was the one who got me on Facebook so that we can keep in touch with our friends in Italy and. Australia and all over the world because they really are, like you said, they're, they're family. This is a family. This is our big, big, huge tribe. And I'll always be part of this and always thankful for the wonderful members that are here with me. I, I love them all. And I know they feel their love back to me. And yeah, those 105 people that we, we know uh, that we share in common on Facebook, we probably have stories on each and every one of them. And uh, they're all good. Yep, There's right. no bad stories. No, 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 no. As, as time goes on, you know, I really do only remember the, the, the good times, you know. Right. Or, or only have time or space for the good ones. So so that's that. So that's, that's, that's the message I have, Greg, that I got from Club Med. I carry on to this day that I didn't have when I was there because I was so cocky and arrogant as most Americans can be. And then you come out of that experience and you're different. And that is to, you know, be kind, spread love. That's it. Yeah. Club Med uh, did a lot of that. Yeah, being uh, being kind uh, costs you nothing, and it, but it right. buys you it buys you everything, right? Right. The smiles you put on those faces, they last. They remember. You know, you remember your vacations more than anything. But for us, we also remember the people we we did that with every day. Customer service, working every day, seven days a week. Greg, it wasn't a job. It was a privilege. Exactly. Wow. Could not, could not have said that better myself, Chris. <laughs> that was, uh, and really, I really want to thank you again for, for sharing your, your story with us. This was amazing. Thank you again, an honor. And it's an honor to, uh, to do this. And thank you for taking the time to go out and find people to do this and, and talk with a lot of us because we all have our own separate stories and they're all beautiful stories individually. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of great people out there who I send my love to. 
Thank you. Yes, and you, you hear listeners, uh, Chris, uh, Chris agreed to do it. You can too. It's uh, hopefully it was it was painless, right, Chris? I mean, absolutely. Okay, thanks. <laughs> absolutely painless. No, 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 no pressure, everyone. Okay. Everybody, just show up. Uh, Greg walks <laughs> you through everything perfectly. <laughs> thanks so much for that. Okay. Well, everyone, that was Chris Wheel from Fresno, California. Thanks again, uh, Chris, and we'll see you all next week. Say bye, Chris. Bye, everybody. Take care.